You talk all that sweet talk, but I ain't coming by. Cut you off, I don't need your love. So you can try all you want. Your time is up, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You say I'm sorry. Hello and welcome to The Dollhouse. My name is Kit Kowalski. I'm an Australian feminist researcher and blogger. I'm joined by my co-host Edie Wyatt, who writes for The Spectator and whom you could also find on Substack. We're here to talk about sex, gender and all the nonsense in the antipodes today. How's it going, Edie? I'm doing a bit better this week. We had a week off last week because I was COVID, COVIDed. Um, yeah, so I, I sort of rode the uh, Wuhan train of death. <laughs> but you didn't die. You're still here with I us. I didn't die. Yeah, I felt like I was okay. going to die at some point. At some point I wished yeah. I would die, uh, but I didn't. I'm, I've survived. Oh, uh, then I had the mother of all migraines on the end of it. So today I've been tweeting about how happy I am to be un, to be well and that I've been making lamb roasts and um banana cakes I saw that I think you got into trouble for calling yourself a trad wife I did I get in trouble for everything every time I steer <laughs> from the very strict thing of being a gender critical feminist I move I get smacked uh so yes the funny thing I'll put it up on the screen I had a tweet at the beginning of being sick um and this woman come and told me um that how dare I talk about being sick when people were dying and um, Palestinians were being killed and oh. she told me to fuck off um, or something like that. I put it up and it says something like, I don't think she said go fuck yourself, but it was similar. <laughs> it was such a shock. I thought, I'm just saying that I got COVID. My main point was because my kids have grown up, as soon as I started feeling sick, I thought, oh, I'm going to be a big baby about this. I'm going to be a total pain in the ass and just let myself be sick. Because when you've got children, you can't. You you're can't. never allowed to be no. sick. There's always something they need. You know, so I thought I'm going to really allow myself to be sick and I'm going to whinge about it. I'm going to have a man flu. And then I tweeted that it wasn't man flu. It was COVID. <laughs> I don't know where she came from. <laughs> but really aggressive. Uh, but I blocked her, but it was it was hilarious. And today when I tweeted about making a cake, um, Dennis actually private messaged me and said, how dare you tweet about that when people are dying in the world? And actually at the same time, someone did attack me for saying that I couldn't call myself a trad wife, uh, that I could, why was it a problem calling myself a trad wife if I was also a feminist? I said, actually, I was just joking about the trad wife. I I didn't think anyone would think that I would, identify as a trad wife <laughs> there's so much in there there's so much sort of stereotypes and so I, I will share that um I I also enjoy my little trad wife days you know I I have days where I I get on my apron and I, I do all my cleaning and cook cakes and bread and you know I, and at the end of it I I take off my apron and I go on and I do a different activity yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that you know enjoying the the domestic sphere um no. I, I think that, that as women joke, sometimes we're meant to not enjoy it for some reason um yeah. or to make play about being the wife yeah. you know the good wife or the and we even we do that I remember a Christian friend of mine came over for dinner and I was just joking I was making something I said yes I'm very submissive I'm a very submissive wife <laughs> she'd known me for a long time and she said when did this start like <laughs> it's a new thing <laughs> that you're into <laughs> yes. well, my, 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 
Uh, my my husband also he he gets into little trad wife days as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> you yeah, know, there'll be, there'll be days. It. Yeah, there'll there'll be days where you know I'll I'll wake up and he would have cleaned the house from top to bottom and he'll be making bread. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> they're like oh I like I like this you know yeah. well my husband's very, very domestic he does all the washing <laughs> he makes most of the food again now but there was a time I think when you have a long marriage oh. um you have seasons of different things and there was a time when I was with the children most of the time and I was cooking and because he was we had a business he would come home late um I, I would make his dinner and put it in the oven and clean up and do mm-hmm. everything with the children, put them to bed so that when he could come home, he could sort of relax. Mm. And for half of that day, I'd usually been in the office with him as well. And some of the jobs that he was waiting for to come in because it was a trucking business, they were the jobs that I booked and I was sort of checking on them to make sure they are okay as well. So it wasn't like I was, you know, I was the traditional wife. I wanted to be home with the children. They wanted me to, to pick them up. You know, I was the one that went to the tuck shop and the sporting things. And I think that's, you know, that's a negotiation. I, I, it, I don't. It have, is, yeah. I want to shame any women for doing any of that. I'm just not into it. No, absolutely not. And um, ultimately, I think that the best situation you can be in with your family is to be able to have those negotiations and those seasons Mm. and to I think possibly um you know what like one of the tragedies of the modern economy is that essentially there's an assumption that your family income like you have two incomes Mm. to support your family and everything is priced in this way that you have two that you need to have two incomes Mm. to support the the rent or the mortgage and the car and the school and the activities and, you know, saving a little bit for the future or having a holiday. Mm. Um, And I think it would be nice if, in my mind, I think it would be ideal if both parents could work part-time and actually have a relationship with their children. And I... there's a real tension there between you know that sort of feminist emancipation mission of okay we need to get women into the workforce because being in the workforce is what makes you economically independent Mm. but there's there's a tension with well you know adults of a certain age have families and those families uh, often uh, depend on the mother physically staying home and it's often the mother who wants to be at home with the kids or the kids you know want to be with the mother um and just the very fact of if you have children often you want to be with them yeah and and i think both both sexes of parents want to be with their kids yeah and and some things it probably is cultural that men don't get things that some women do you know i He's great with Lebanese food. He makes some beautiful food, but he can't make a cake to save his life. Um, and so all the cupcakes, I did all those and I made all the costumes for book week and because my mother taught me to sew, you know. Mm. It's it just, and it's a bit special. And, you you know, I wanted them to grow up knowing that I, not only I love them, but I, I, I cared about their book week. I cared about how they presented at school um, and that they had healthy lunches every day and all that kind of stuff. Um, Maybe it is uh, culturally constructed that women are interested in that, but I was involved in that. You know, I was, I did make all their lunches, Um, but that doesn't mean that we're, my husband and I are stuck in a gendered relationship because it's, it was as they grew up, you know, it all just kind of went back to, like when we were single, you know, um, he does probably most of the cooking now. Well, one of the things that really did come out during the the COVID times when we were all in isolation in our houses is I remember there were actually quite a few news stories where um, like the like the gender 
inequality, and I say gender specifically here, where the gender inequality of housework kind of came to a head where it was realised that, you know, the, the male and the female were both in the same house for the same amount of time because they were both stuck there, um, both doing a full-time job from mm-hmm. home, from the kitchen table, and yet the wife would be doing the cooking, the cleaning, the cooking, the, you know, looking after the kids, the picking up after everybody. Um, That's how it happened. Yeah, like mm-hmm. there's... There's something, um, it is real. Like there, there yeah. really is an unequal division of labour. There's an and... injustice about it. I think my mother felt that injustice and she was very sick too. And when she yeah. started to get even sicker, I loved my dad, but he didn't step up. You know, he just didn't think that was his job. Mm. Um, he just let everything just deteriorate um, and then said, you know, your mother's not that good at housework. <laughs> It's it was his you know his cockney was born mm. in 1927 he was from another era and it's all very nice to excuse that but we try and well, there's no point lying about it no um, it it was a problem it still is a problem in a lot of people's lives you know not everyone we're probably very middle class in that sense you know in our values of equality and no. I think that there is also like there's a generational component to it as well. Like there are there are generations of men who are grow who are brought up to believe that it's just not their job, right? They yeah. they have a job as a breadwinner and you know the woman has the job as the domestic sphere. Mm. But also there's generations of women who've been brought up with that mentality as well. Yeah. And they don't readjust when they also become a breadwinner. No. And I honestly don't really know, um, you know, how to tackle that because, yeah, it's it's systemic, but the place it's occurring is inside a personal private relationship with another individual. Mm. So it's not like you've got a workplace supervisor who can come along and say, hey, Jim, you're not pulling your weight, (laughs) right? That's usually the family and from people from very strict cultural backgrounds, that does happen. The mother-in-law comes in with the whistle and says, "Hey, you know, this is yeah. the, this, these are the, supposed to be the rules." But we didn't have any of that. My husband grew up in a uh, family that was Islamic. His father was violent and extremely patriarchal. Um, but he didn't adopt any of that. He decided he wasn't going to be that man. Um, and I think that's a legitimate thing for a culture to put that expectation on men mm. that they don't. Uh, look for mothers he wasn't the last thing another thing about middle eastern families i don't want to speak out of turn here but sometimes the mothers can be a little bit over involved is <laughs> and he didn't want that anymore he didn't want a wife who was a mother he wanted yeah a partner. he wanted a wife yeah so you know men can even when they come from traditional backgrounds they can learn and I think that we get that lost and, and men get very defensive. The men's rights activist types and Jordan Peterson types get very defensive when we talk about, I mean, they they very freely talk about how women should be. But when we start to say, well, men need to, you know, come to the relationship um, on an equal footing, uh, sometimes they do get a bit, you know, annoyed that we we have an opinion about, you know, masculine the masculine world. Jordan Peterson, he has a lot of opinions about women, doesn't he? He does have a lot of opinions about women, yeah. <laughs> he likes to talk I, about women like we're sort of um, these animal people, but men in these very romantic terms, like you got to you got to be even. If you want to talk in biological senses about evolutionary stuff, then um, you need to talk about both. I, you can't talk about men as Greek gods and mystical and in the Bible and all the rest of it and then say our oh, women are just animals that are subject to their impulses, you know. Yeah, I, I like some of the things he says about, no, wait, I, I won't say I like them, but <laughs> I find some of some of the arguments he makes are like quite insightful and quite interesting. Yeah. And and I think that there's there's something to be had there about talking about how women interact with the modern workplace and say you know Mm. professional careers and like these are you can make these complaints from a feminist perspective as well Mm. right so one of the things I um I remember hearing uh 
uh, and it was probably from uh, Cheryl Sandberg, actually, from the from Lean In. Um, her talking about being, you know, high powered professional woman in a workplace, and she was talking to a woman who said the thing that she looks for is if they have um, free food, if the workplace has free food, like they have free vending machines or they have a free kitchen or, um, you know, something like that. She's not interested in that because it signals that what they want is for you to live at the workplace mm. and to work, to come in early, to leave late, to not leave during lunchtime. They mm. don't want you to have an outside family. Mm. And she said, like, as a woman, right, I have a family, you know, I'm a middle-aged woman, I'm, you know, very successful, have a family, have a husband, have kids. I don't want to be, you know, in a patronising workplace that is going to be my parent, right? Oh. So, um, yeah, like there's, there is a lot about the modern workplace that is not set up for women and it's not set up for women who are of reproductive age who have a family, no, or who want to have a baby, right? It's, it's, so. it's just not. And but the way Jordan Peterson talks about it, he sort of talks about it as as if there's a fault in women, yeah. <laughs> rather than there's a fault in the system. Yeah, that it these doesn't aliens cater. Come into the workplace, and we don't know how to deal with these aliens. And they've got their coloured lips, and they've got their high <laughs> heels, and they're floating all their sexiness everywhere. And the poor old man. And then, and then they want to have a baby, and they're going to just ruin all their career. And that's you know, right. they're going to drop out of their tenure track because they want a baby. <laughs> Focus as man. Yeah, it's, it's, it's it's a very it's, masculine perspective and that would not bother me if he opened a dialogue with women about some of these issues but even his conversation with Helen Joyce it sounds confrontational he was he kept trying to catch her out that she had catholic values um oh, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. think she denied like she's an atheist and he was trying to show her how she had a catholic worldview which is fine but most of us know that we have a, a worldview that's given to us from our family. Like, it's not rocket science. You don't need to, it's patronising. I thought it was patronising because she's an extremely intelligent woman and he could have had a lot more interesting discussions with her um, than that one. Um, now, speaking of workplaces, we are going to talk Ooh, a little yes. bit about workplaces tonight, aren't we? The topic um, is not that I've been making cakes and being criticised for being called a trade wife on the tweets. The topic for tonight is that it's asexual week, ace week. Is that is that the story? Yeah, it's absolutely ace week, uh, which means, which is, uh, ace is short for asexuality. So it's asexuality awareness week. And we can't be more excited uh, we are very excited here at the dollhouse. We've been waiting. Uh, we've been getting our stockings out ready. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I will share that my husband is away this week, so I'm fully in the swing <laughs> of asexuality awareness. <laughs> He's been sent away deliberately. Yes, we timed it uh, so that uh, we could fully observe asexuality awareness. Sorry. Well, someone did not yeah. say on the tweets tonight that since I'd made a lamb roast for my husband and a nice cake, I might get, get lucky. Um, but I should have I should have been a good advocate and said, actually, no, um, we're participating in Ace Week this week. Yes. And no no sex, please. Um, no sex. <laughs> we're, so... we're, <laughs> we're podcasters. Yes. Um... <laughs> we're members of Acon. <laughs> So, look, asexuality, um, what is it? Is it, Yes, it's such a good question. Uh, so in pursuit of this, uh, I went out and I listened to several podcasts over the last couple of days to augment my understanding of asexuality. I was, I, too, I was far too sick to be reading, listening to it. I, I sent some podcasts to Edie and she accused me of gaslighting her. <laughs> gaslighting. <laughs> I'm lying with the worst. <laughs> A headache that God ever invented. Saying, oh, you're gaslighting me. I can't. <laughs> Just the thought of watching people talk about asexuality from the ABC or wherever they were from. Where they, yeah, you, so I listened to a couple and uh, 
One of them was uh, Ladies We Need to Talk, which has is from the, the ABC and it has Yumi Steins. Uh, she's the author of that Kids Let's Talk About Sex book. Which... <laughs> which you know had some pretty uh ripe content in it yeah, uh, I and imagine her this week i tag her in something because there was something coming out about how damaging anal sex can be for women yeah uh, which yumi has not mentioned one little bit of and she promotes it openly that's another thing that bothers me about some of those sex books that they give to kids um, they don't want to put morals in there but they're not putting any health information in there either mm. that might seem to be judgmental um to gay men and I don't care what gay men do and I'm sure they have their own health problems which they can talk about in their own issues but young girls and sex it's really important to get some information to them properly but we're not we're giving them this what's what's you <laughs> saying about asexuality <laughs> well okay good we're not going to talk about anal sex because that's uh, a whole uh can of worms <laughs> Uh, and uh, I also listened to a, a quite a nice podcast called Sounds Fake But Okay, <laughs> which was by two young women who are asexual and aromantic, and they, they basically explain uh, what, what the whole dealio is. So, look, for those of you who don't know, asexuality is defined as a lack of sexual attraction to any person. So some people might be heterosexual. So if you're a heterosexual woman, you are you might have a sexual attraction to men at, but and not to women. So imagine that lack of attraction to women and then just generalize it to everybody. I guess. So it's not having any sexual attraction. Which, um, you know, is fine. I, I don't really have a problem with people saying that they don't have a sexual attraction. Um, yeah. Now, they're pretty insistent that it's not a health concern. And one of the podcasts I listened to... Um, when when of, they say it's not something, you think, why do, I, why do they say it's not that? And yeah. Yeah. I can see why. Well, it's, you know, it, one of the podcasts I listened to, they talked about how it was um, there. there is a health disorder uh, which is like low libido or very low libido. Yeah. And so that is a problem. And they tried to make the distinction between it bothering you and it not bothering you. Mm. So if you don't have any sexual desire then and it bothers you then that's a problem but if it doesn't bother you then it's a sexual identity yeah okay it's kind of compartmentalizing i was looking for something so i just um I listened to a podcast with jennifer billick on it today and she did a quote about the commodification um or something but keep going I'll find it at some point so however okay just not having a sexual attraction right is like you know I don't really know why we need to talk about that it's it just it seems um fairly sort of ordinary as far as I'm concerned yeah, um nobody's business right no nothing to talk about in the workplace you wouldn't think yeah and and similarly you know if like if you're in the workplace and someone's gay, again, like what's the what's the real problem? Like why are we talking about that in the workplace? It does really? have some relevance in the sense that, you know, workplaces do have social aspects as well and we talk about our partners and I think it's important um, for us to say, look, you know, if your partner's got, you, you know, if your colleague's female and she's got a, a wife, we're not going to make a big deal about that. We're not going no. to try, we're going to try and not exclude that person. We, most people in modern workplaces wouldn't. But I do remember when the Syrian refugees came, What that was one of the things that shocked them is to see uh -huh. uh, women, you know, I had a restaurant at one point and one of my staff came in and said, 
you know those two women they're at the front kissing <laughs> you know you've got to say look we don't they're allowed make a big deal about that sort of thing it, not only in the workplace but in Australia and I think that cultural understanding I think it's okay for gay groups to say even if it's Akon like Akon obviously is involved in this but if they were coming into the workplace saying look we're trying to make an inclusive place um, for gay and lesbians and part of that if you're not already aware is that we <laughs> We don't alienate people for being gay and lesbian. I think that's okay. I think that's perfectly fine. And I think that is what their Pride and Diversity scheme really started out. That was the intention of it. Mm. And that's that's still how they managed to get uh, workplaces on board, right, is they say this is so that people who are gay and lesbian in the workplace don't feel alienated. Yeah. And, you know, look, I I had a colleague, I onboarded a colleague earlier this week. So we had some recruitment and, um, you know, we were sitting having a chat as I was the first person that, he, that he's met in the workplace. We're sitting having a chat and he said, oh, yes, my partner does X, Y, Z. Um, and I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. And he said, yes, he does this. It's like, oh, okay. All right, next next topic, right? Like, and that's really all it takes is for them, for someone to be able to say, you know, my partner, he is like this or he likes this. Yeah. And then for the person they're talking to, to just treat that like it is incredibly normal every day yeah. and not a big problem. <laughs> and not to, I think one, I was listening to one lesbian um, speak on Spaces once where she said, it becomes uncomfortable. The LGBT stuff is becoming uncomfortable in the workplace because people assume it's so over-sexualized that people assume that you're kind of into everything because you're gay, because you're a lesbian, mm. you're more sexual, you're like men, you know, um, when actually she was actually very sexually conservative and uh, wasn't interested in every woman that she she was a normal lesbian woman. Um, so some of it is generating the opposite it's generating it to be uncomfortable for like a gay person who might just want to go to the workplace and not talk about their sex life so this is the thing with asexuals like and this is why it's so weird to have it as an identity one of the things that I, I think is very little known about asexuality and it's one of the myths that they try to bust is that it only refers to the sexual attraction. It doesn't refer to having sex. So asexuals can still have sex and they can still engage, you know, they can still have a partner and they can still have either, you know, a platonic partner or they can have a sexual partner who they have sex with um, or they can still have a sexual desire it's just that they don't have sexual attraction and it becomes really strangely sort of hair splitting right um and so when you actually get to it like there's no real referent to like what is asexuality what is it that it doesn't really refer to anything other than an internal subjective feeling it's one of these entry points into making reality subjective just like when we talk about gender identity it's breaking that it's breaking the boundaries of what we think sex is and how sex is connected to romantic romantic feelings as well um i think we talked about jazz jennings a few weeks ago might have been a month ago something um and not just Jazz Jennings, but how we're becoming aware that a lot of these children who've had uh, puberty suppression and cross-sex hormones, they are effectively desexed. Mm. So there's a certain cohort who are being brought into the trans community who will not have a sex drive. Um, they will be effectively uh, eunuchs or, you know, what we used to yeah, consider... They- People in our community, there's always been a certain element of people in our community who we assume 
the East of the Priests or um, eunuchs, you know, people who we assume that are not are not a danger sexually, they're not a threat sexually because they don't have a sex drive. Mm. Um, so some of this I've heard you say, Kit, before is kind of laying cover for that, is is turning uh, turning what is actually sexual dysfunction because that's not normal. Um, to not have a sex drive is not normal. Um, so turning sexual dysfunction into an identity to cover for what they're actually doing. Yeah, and it is it's lay it's laying down the identity for those children to grow up into. And it might just be a terrible coincidence that so many of these uh these children who were de-sexed at age 10 um happen to grow up to be asexual. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so which doesn't mean that they don't engage in sex again like this is the really strange thing about the asexual identity is that it's literally just saying that you don't have sexual attraction to men or women it's not even saying that you don't have a sex drive right so um, so they will say that asexual people can still have sex or can still might still engage in all sorts of levels of of sexual activity um because and then they say well there's there's different reasons for engaging in sex so you might engage in sex because you have a partner who wants to have sex with you right or and because or because it feels nice you know it can feel and it, whether or not that re- results in orgasms or um sexual climax it's a bit lie back and thinking isn't it yeah or because you want to have a baby uh or or because uh you you want intimacy with someone and it's a way for you to get intimacy or possibly now this i don't think this is actually covered in any of the research i did but or because you're being paid to have sex yeah right now (laughs) this is it's it's really disturbing that on the one hand there's this stereotype that we're sold which is that you know everybody will go through a period where they will experience romantic attraction to someone and then this will lead into sexual feelings they will um, chase each other through an airport, have a passionate kiss and live ha- happily ever after, mm. no questions asked. That is a dangerous stereotype about romantic love, right? On the other hand, it's just as dangerous to say that you can have romantic feelings about someone and have sex with them even if you don't have any sexual feelings for them mm. and that this is a satisfactory way to live your life. Mm. that uh, it's almost like saying that um yeah you should lie back and think of England right it's grooming it's a it's themed a type of grooming and another way to reframe we, we, we assume it's women as um women and people who have lost their sex drive as passive recipients um of sex and that's okay um we've fought for so long to say well Actually, women um, have a right to enjoy sex and to get, and that one of the one of the purposes of the relationship um, is to have a fulfilling sex life. And sometimes there is a drive and balance. Um, that's not unusual. It's not like you'd go to the counsellor and you know um, they would be shocked that one of you has a greater sex drive than the other. Mm. This is not an unusual phenomenon, and it's not it's not solved by saying just suck it up. You're asexual, that's your identity, you suck it up. No, you got to both work together to figure it out. That's what relationships, that's what a healthy relationship is about. You know. Well, see, this is, another, this is another way in which the asexual identity can sort of harm women, which is um, if you have, if you're asexual and you have a partner, who has a higher sex drive than you, you, what are your options, right? 
either not have sex with them yeah or have sex with them and you know you don't necessarily enjoy it mm. or three you can outsource your wifely duties to them and uh, allow them to have sex with other people so one of the podcasts I listened to was Yumi Steins uh, mm. ladies we need to talk and she interviewed a woman who said that this was the solution with her husband right and this is something that's really common across asexuals is that if you don't want to have sex with your partner you can hire a prostitute to have sex with your partner on your behalf or you can allow them to cheat as long as there's no quote unquote no emotional attachment right so it's commodification of our human sexuality and it's it's outsourcing one woman's problems onto another woman who's paid to engage in the sexual encounter. That's right, yeah. It's like a um, concubine. Yeah. It's the same kind of arrangement. Yeah. A lower-class woman who does the deed that you don't want to do. Yeah, and um, this, this you, woman... For whatever reason, you find your husband revolting. This woman actually said that it was, you know, again, the gaslighting... It was it was my idea. It was my idea that he had sex with other people. Yeah, of course. Of course it was her idea, right? Yeah. Um and but at the start, we just started with sex workers because there would be no feelings involved. Now it, it's she makes it sound like he's going out to get petrol or something, yeah. right? That uh, you know, the the fact is that you're sending your partner out to have like to pay to have intercourse with a woman who is only there because she's getting paid Mm. someone that you see as not able to form the like an emotional attachment someone who he's prohibited from having an emotional attachment to because she's she's not a participant in the sexual encounter there's also one of the elephants in the room i mean i had a bit of involvement with talk you know friends and christian counselors and Mm -hmm. some of this stuff gets talked about in the christian world where there's an imbalance you know um of sexual and you see a bit of the talk around the christian worlds where they you know the men will say well women are due they should give give it up you know for their man which is an unsatisfactory response. Um, the other thing is, you know, pastors got onto the idea and Christian sex books eventually got onto the idea that actually um, if the men would make their wives orgasm, then the wives would be more keen <laughs> to have sex. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes men are lousy lovers and that's the reason yeah. that women don't want to have sex because they make it boring. I mean, if you if you made it, pretty exciting you wouldn't think or made them comfortable and so there's this whole bunch of work that has to be done where a man will have to learn how his wife's body functions he'll have to learn how to make her comfortable to kind of um sort of seduce her I guess within the marriage and and that doesn't stop just because you're married like that that actually doesn't go away that need for um yeah yeah affection and connection women need you know the, the, even the geniuses of the christian world figured out that women need a little bit different things that man that men need yeah. and that we could find a solution to these problems um i've got the quote from jennifer billick here where she says in the thing we're being colonized for the market not by the market, but for the market. market. I thought that was a very interesting concept, even in this. You know, it is it is the colonisation of, of people. I mean, we say women because we're particularly focused on women. There's a, there's a need there. There's a sex drive imbalance. So we're going to find out how to negotiate this with identities and with the market, like sex workers. So you bring the market into the marriage um, to meet a need um all the you know 
the labour of the other women that this man's going out and picking up uh, without, you know, I'm sure he's going to say, look, I'm married. I can't offer you anything. I'm not interested in anything else but sex. How do you feel about that? He's not saying that. No. He's he's giving women the idea that he might be, you know, an option but, for them. Look, this, uh, this question of... Um... Like there is a broader question of the ethical non-monogamy, which is the, um, you know, polyamory, polygyny, polygamy, um, mm. the idea that you can have like not just more than one sexual partner at a time, but you can actually have like ongoing sexual relationships with more than one person. Mm. And I have done a lot of reading about this uh, in the past and um, I think my, and I, I, because I've known a lot of people who have sort of given this a go as well, this polyamory. So I've I've seen it um, unfold. And my conclusion really is that most of us don't have the time or the attention span to make polyamory actually work mm. <laughs> you know there's I I honestly think that it's a bit of a con um what a bit and of investment that, in getting someone yeah into bed isn't there I mean and, from meeting unless it's a sex worker there's some work in that there is yeah it's much more efficient to have one person I'm not suggesting that I'm an efficiency person. I'm religious and I believe in marriage. Um, but even I, I often not think about how other people would live and I think about how much effort are these guys saying, oh, you're picking up all these chicks. And I'm thinking, <laughs> how much is he really? I mean, considering the work that it takes to meet someone, get them from drinks into bed, and then to keep doing that over and over again, well, I think your lifestyle, like you set your lifestyle up for that, and then you can you can sustain that if you if you set yourself up right to to go and have a, a different woman every week. You have to source candidates, so I mean, you got to find a bar, yeah. you have a place, you got to find. No, you've got a Tinder. You got just get oh, onto Tinder. Tinder. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, just um, you know, you get on. Sort of yeah, stock of them. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I'm very unqualified to be making. Um, <laughs> I'm qualified to talk about marriage. So, but, the yeah. the thing that the thing that really like the the two things that stuck out to me about ethical non monogamy were the time and effort that it takes to maintain a relationship with more than one person at once. Yeah. Um and. There was there was one uh, there was one story that I read about a household of it was something like twenty gay men and they all lived in a big block of flats and they all sort of had an open door policy and they all kind of like shared sexual relationship with with each other mm. and I just thought to myself what happens when one of them wants to move out and they need to get a new flatmate. Mm. like how do you advertise that room right <laughs> how do you put view, that uh, in the paper wanted flat mate with flat benefits. Mate <laughs> and benefits with 19 other men uh, it, it, it's kind of it's it locks you in doesn't it yeah um yeah. and I can, I can see how it works for gay men <laughs> Um, yeah. And then I don't think yeah. it works with women unless you sell women en masse a lie about their sexuality, which is what is being done. I, I don't think it's even their sexuality, but jealousy is a big thing. There is a lot of talk in the ethical non-monogamy community about learning to live with jealousy, managing your jealousy, not being jealous, you know, dealing moment. with your emotions. And it's like, well, at one at some point, jealousy... Yeah, I think that people don't manage jealousy very well. I don't think we're, we're really trained to manage our jealousy. And I think we're trained to have jealousy. I think that's how we're but, but at the same time, being jealous is a reaction because 
you know, you, you value the person and you value the commitment that they've made to you, right? You, you had an expectation and your expectation wasn't being met. Jealousy is not envy either. People get those terms mixed up. Yeah. It's, it's one of my pet annoyances oh. um, because jealousy, you know, the Bible, it talks about that we serve a jealous God. The concept of that is that je- God is jealous over his people because they're his people. And our wife is jealous over her husband because that's her husband. So in, in the concept of jealousy, there's an ownership idea that we that a husband and wife are jealous over each other because they want exclusive access and they have a right to exclusive access to each other. That's the concept in our kind of uh, worldview of jealousy, that it's not it's not a sin, even though it can drive you insane. Um, it's a natural part of a loving relationship that that you want that person to yourself and so the progressives will claim sort of paint that as a um as a smallness as a small mindedness that you only want one person for yourself forever and that your desire to have only them is selfish but we've kind of built our religion and our belief system around it and and i don't I've given it a good test over the years Um, and it's a perfectly legitimate way to live your life, to say you want one partner for life. Um, The fact that it now is not considered the only idea doesn't bother me at all. Um, That other people have views about marriage, but that they're putting them in these frameworks and teaching our children them like asexuality is very disturbing. Because it's just an experiment in in commodification of human beings, frankly. Well, in terms of um, in terms of the jealousy, I think yeah, progressive arguments do tend to link it to yeah, small mindedness, mm. and they link it to um, like patriarchy and ownership over women and over ownership over women's sexuality. Mm. Um, so. Yeah, you shouldn't be jealous if your your wife has a another a partner, right? Um, but what we actually see is that it's the reverse. So it's one of those things where we're being sold on one concept, but what's actually happening is the reverse. Yes. And what we what we are seeing more often is that there's a there's a woman who is quote unquote asexual. Wow. And her male partner wants to have sex with more than one person. Wow. Like he wants to go outside of the marriage because she's not performing sexually. And economically, what can she do? Like wow. economically, she's still stuck in the marriage. So, you wow. know, and there's no there's no morality because you know if you're if you're progressive you don't have that that sort of morality to say to him no you're not allowed to do this it's against our our beliefs or it's against our values yeah but also that's a social thing isn't there if he's a nice looking bloke he's got a good job he's got a really good income he's prepared to stay you've got children there's a social disincentive and if you don't really have any need to go out, just say he's shit in bed and you think that that's what sex is, is this lousy bloody bloke who is just crap in bed. You think, why do I want another one of them? I might as well keep him, mm. let him go and do whatever he wants, um, which is, which is again, a framework which is um, supporting men's sexual access to women. Mm. And I, I just think it, it just feels a little bit dysfunctional to me. Like it feels stable but dysfunctional, whereas, um, yeah. you know, I think as I've got along in my life, my attitudes towards sexual monogamy have changed like quite significantly. Um, and I I have come to really appreciate like putting your energy into one relationship. You know, so there's um, not many benefits. Yeah, and yeah. People, people, not every culture in the world hasn't had marriage just yeah. because it's, uh, you know, some sort of uh, crazy idea. There's there's benefits for the society as well, 
um, I guess that's another topic altogether. But one thing I wanted to mention is the way that these ideologies as well and identities shield not only sexual dysfunction but sexual trauma because a lot of women, one of the, not a lot of women, but one of the symptoms of sexual trauma is frigidity. And so that can manifest itself in young women um, if they have been subject to sexual trauma. And so to make that an identity, to shield that as an identity is another way of shielding the kind of sexual trauma that, that women carry rather than dealing with it, rather than saying, look, you don't have any sex drive. That's not normal and that's a problem. You know, I'm, I'm aware that I've got friends who are celibate, who've been celibate their whole life, who, who live celibately happily. Um, it's not that they don't have a sex drive. They've never found someone they don't particularly want. They get to a point in life where they don't want anyone. They're not dysfunctional. I'm not suggesting that there's a problem there. But there is such a thing as sexual dysfunction that comes from trauma. And this is where, like, moving moving these, these statuses or these choices into the realm of identity yeah. has carries with it a whole raft of problems. Yeah. You know, and just as we see, um, you know, if a grown man sort of says to you, I want to cut my penis off, like, you think, wow, why? And there's a story there and you want to know why, you know, he might still be better off (laughs) if he goes ahead with that. Okay. It might be his choice. It might be something that we can't interfere with or intervene in. Okay. Go cut your penis off. Knock yourself out. But there's a story there and it's unusual. And we could acknowledge that it's a really strange thing to want Mm. and that we would only allow it under condition. Like a, a surgeon would only do it under, you know, very stringent conditions that this this man would be actually better off. You would investigate. But if that man says, I'm a woman, I want to cut my penis off, mm. it's fine. It's in the realm of unassailable identity. Yeah. And we don't ask any questions. We have to accept and we have to validate. And we don't delve deeper and we really risk missing what are the deeper issues. Mm-hmm. And similarly with asexuality, like, yeah, sure, you you can choose to not have sex or you can ch- choose to not engage, right, in, in, sexual, um, in sexual culture, okay? That's up to you. It's perfectly fine. But at the same time, you know, we do know that there are some things that cause this. We do know that it's caused by trauma. We do know it's caused by diet, it, by pills, by all sorts of different things. And why wouldn't we do that investigation? Well, we yeah. can't because it's in the realm of unassailable identity. And once it's an identity, we just have to affirm you and we have right. to just say yes. And dysfunctional cultural meanings too. I mean, I'm not against talking about the culture that's attached to sex, which we used to call gender. I, I'm I think it's okay to say, look, um, all right, how do we how do we talk about um the imbalance, sexual imbalance between men and women mm. and how um women negotiate the world of men when essentially they want different things from life and they've got different risks. Um, in engaging in sex this whole identity conversation really takes over that Um, and you can tell that there's no better example than Yumi Steins and the way that book I mean she's promoting herself as a feminist as sort of sex positive the whole sex positive movement is damaging to women Uh, not only is it promoting prostitution now it's going into surrogacy um and pretending that women are essentially the same as men in terms of their sex drive and how they can get liberation through um, sort of prolific sexual activity, when we know in our own experience that, that that's not the case. You know, many women um, have fulfilling sex lives. Um, without having read Yumi Stein's book, 
<laughs> well, look, <laughs> the, the Yumi Steins, the Yumi Steins philosophy is that the more you talk about sex, the better everybody is, right? Yeah. And the rise of the asexual identity, I think, really shows that that's not the case. Yeah. I think in many ways, uh, the asexual identity, it is a backlash against um, over sexualization. Mm. And there's some there are some positive aspects to this identity. Mm-hmm. And one of them is that you can use it as a shield against over sexualization. Yeah. Um, Especially for yeah. young girls, I think if they are just surrounded by this and they just say, look, I, I'm a, I'm an ace, I'm asexual, they can hide in it. I don't think it'd be very successful to tell the truth because it, it you're coming up against the realities of the male sex drive constantly. So when you're a teenager, you've got boys that have got massive amounts of testosterone flowing through their bodies. Then they're, they're not going to be, and they, if they find a girl attractive, they're not going to say, oh, yeah, okay, she's asexual. They're going to tease her like they always have, you know. Are oh, you virgin? Oh, you're not very attractive anyway. So are you lesbian? Are you lezo? That's just going to go forever. It's better to teach girls about how to deal with their trauma, their sexual trauma, their, to, to let them know that they need time. Girls need more time to develop um, their kind of sexual self, I think, and to give them that space just because they're allowed to, not because they have some sort of sexual identity that they can cling to. They shouldn't need a sexual identity to cling to. They should be in a society which says to them, girls, take your time. I Yeah, and ultimately the asexual identity, I don't think it's a very good shield either because no. it only it only talks about your sexual attraction and it is itself a sexuality right it and it's it's really hard to get your head around that it's not a lack of sexuality it is a sexuality mm. so it's still in the sexual realm mm. like um but it's not actually what makes it a really flimsy shield is that all it's saying is i'm not attracted to anyone but it it doesn't preclude you having sex Whereas, say, um, you know, if you can, if you had an identity as someone who was celibate, you could say, "I've, I'm celibate." You know, I have. Yeah. That's that's what I'm doing. Then you're actually talking about what you're willing to do. You're saying, "I'm not going to have sex. I'm celibate," right? And you can have reasons for that, or you don't have to get into them. But if you're asexual. Asexual still have sex. Mm. And there is the much oh, more God. sinister, well, it's the much more sinister um, uh, counterpart of asexual, which is aromantic. And so aromantics don't feel romantic attraction. So you can literally meet someone and they say, well, I'm, I'm aromantic, and it just means that they want to have sex, but they don't want to have a romantic relationship. Mm. it's it's a you know like what jennifer was saying it's we're kind of being taken apart for the market we're being disembodied where our sex is is being disconnected from our romance when in reality sex and romance and that's something about the gay and lesbian community as well and, and they will tell you you will listen to them for five seconds is that they're not just sexually attracted Lesbians are not just sexually attracted to women, they're romantically attracted to mm. women. And that's a big part of their culture. Um, and it's the same, even though homosexual men are a little bit more over-sexual, sexualized because they're men, um, they also have a tradition of romance between men, which makes people uncomfortable. Um and that is one of the things that makes people uncomfortable that we need to face in society. But just because 
one thing makes people uncomfortable doesn't mean that the making of people uncomfortable itself is progress, which is how we get mixed up here. Sure, we need to talk about the fact that particularly now where girls are being sent off to gender clinics, we need to be able to talk to girls and say, yes, some girls are romantically attracted because that's before, even before the sexuality kicks in, they might feel romantically attracted to other Mm. girls. And that's something that's important to talk about. And I sound like a gay rights activist as the second time I've tried to make this point. And I don't mean to be because I'm straight, but it's they've created this from the structure of what was the gay rights movement. And so there are some points at the basis which are true, which ring true in society, but then they take it off into this whole area which makes the actual original concepts meaningless. Romance is not connected to sex. It's just, it's nonsense for a start. Of course it is. I personally think that this asexual identity, it does nothing to combat what they call compulsory sexuality, which they have actually stolen that concept from lesbians and lesbian theory. So lesbians talk about compulsory heterosexuality, which is where basically women and girls are groomed into the idea that one day they'll meet a man, he'll sweep them off their feet and, you know, they'll go off and have babies and, um, you know, live a heterosexual sort of idol. Whereas given the opportunity to explore, um, there are some girls who will be lesbians, right? Yeah. So they they talk about resisting that compulsory heterosexuality. Well, asexuals talk about resisting compulsory sexuality. So they've even stolen this. Um, but I don't think that it does anything to resist compulsory sexuality because it is part of the LGBT um, alphabet soup they're not able to critique those sexual identities. All they can do is label themselves and and chant, well, if no one's getting hurt, then it's okay. As long as you're consenting, then it's okay. Yeah. So, you know, I don't feel sexual attraction, but I have sex with you because I'm consenting to, mm. and that's okay because I consented. Yeah, you know, you're my partner and you're allowed to go and have sex with a a woman you've paid because you're consenting and she's being paid. So there you go. Very very progressive. Um, And we don't want to shame the man because he's not able to shame his wife, which would have been, you know, kind of the old reason. People would have said, oh, yeah, he's um, he's rubbish in bed. Um, So she's happy (laughs) for him to go somewhere else it deliberately deconstructs the kind of ideas we had about romance but I don't I don't see that in the gay community or certainly not the gay friends that I've got um they talk about their partners in very romantic senses they wrote poetry to them they you know it's a it's a normal romantic relationship that often involves an exclusive sexual relationship not always but some, but you know certainly less for gay men but it doesn't mean that they get the right to come into schools and workplaces and impose this nonsense on people who actually have a very traditional view of um even if they're not traditional they're in a you know male female thing humans often mate for life they often bring up children together and they often find uh, pleasure sexually and romantically in those relationships um, to try and imply that that's kind of some kind of social construction that's been devised by the capitalist market and this is pro- progress it's very I'm going to have should have a section called it's so middle class <laughs> it is it is pretty middle class isn't it yeah so the thing is like it just it doesn't have the teeth that it needs to critique what it needs to critique yeah so um and, it's so bourgeois well <laughs> and it's it's grounded in subjective feeling and therefore it's 
it's simply it simply doesn't have the political um like rigor that's required to actually talk about anything beyond what you're feeling so it it can't talk about compulsory sexuality it can't talk about over sexualization it can't critique pornography or surrogacy it can't critique unhappy marriages it can't critique um male sexual entitlement feminism can critique all of that yeah (laughs) we we can we have the capability we have the analytical rigor we have the frameworks to critique those things and to come up with pretty good analysis and some reasonable shots at solutions yeah so feminism and like particularly the second wave feminism it came up with all sorts of potential solutions to these problems so um you know there was a theoretical framework and then there was consciousness raising where they got women together and they all talked about their experiences Mm. they all talked about how their husbands were crap in bed Mm. and and then they were like, well, right, what are we going to do about it? Mm. So there was a lot of solutions like lesbian commune, right. <laughs> okay, lesbian commune, let's try that one out. Uh, there was. That'd be low um, down the list for me. <laughs> there was, there was uh, you know, uh, like making women equal in the workplace, in the boardroom, you know, making women economically equal. Yeah getting men to do housework, getting men into, like, to do their share. And to talk about women's bodies and, you know, in the 70s I was talking about some mysterious G-spot, which I'm sure was, was no help to anyone. But women's magazines does talk about the nature of the female orgasm and how it worked. I'm sure many people knew about it before the 70s. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they didn't invent it. Every generation thinks they invented sex, I think. Um, no, it's just because we don't want to think about our parents doing it. We don't, no. We don't, <laughs> I don't want to think about it. No, well, no. Well, the kids don't want to think about it either. I've got a funny tweet here I'll put it up on the screen from liking one of our mates, uh, Danish mates, uh, the Viking Dane. He's, his comment is, this ace community in a nutshell, no one cares about them not wanting relationships, yet they claim their hardship is worse than gay men and lesbian women. Just incredible. Are the Vikings a gay man? Um, And he's got this tweet where he's saying to this this ace person, uh, gay people being killed in many countries, persecuted, um, harmed, etc. No one cares if you don't want sex, nor be in a relationship. You are not the same. So he's basically saying, look, guys, if you don't want to have sex, if you don't give a fuck, we don't give a fuck. We don't care about your your inability to care about sex. Just put it away. <laughs> Go and talk about it somewhere else because it does not it doesn't belong in our advocacy circles, is what he's saying. And this guy's retweeting him saying, "Life is tough. Deal with it, man." Um, in other words, we don't care about the struggle for gays. We want it's such a narcissistic idea. We want the whole workplace and the whole thing to surround. The fact that we we don't give any Fs about anybody. It's a very well, difficult thing to get on board with, isn't it? It's a very difficult cause to really feel for. Well, look, I'm just on the uh, a- AustralianAsexuals.com uh, blog and they've got a picture of some asexuals marching in Mardi Gras, right, and, um, and they have a sign that say I am not broken and it really just seems like a lot of projection as far as I'm concerned you know it's I I really don't care if you have sex or not and I I'm you know very sorry that these people think that that means that they're broken or that someone's telling them that if they don't want to have sex then they're in the wrong because you can always say no to sex. You can always say no. You can always say no. But there is there is some indicators that if you don't have any sex drive or if you're repulsed by the touch of your partner, there could be something wrong with you. 
then there's not necessarily something wrong with you. There might be a creep. You might be all sorts of problems. Uh, external. It, might, it, it might be an indication that you need to like exit the relationship. Yeah, there might or be that you, the relationship, yeah. Or that you need to work on the relationship or, you know, yeah. do something about it. Well, like we are saying, getting better sex, getting the man better trained to deal, to deal with the body. Um, if it's a man, maybe getting the woman more sensitized to his needs. These these are all personal needs that we don't really want to talk about in the workplace, but we are thinking them. Like if you go and announce to yourself that you don't want sex, we're all thinking we don't care. Why do you on, need to say it? If you're going on and on about it, we are going to think there might be something wrong with you mm. because why are you coming into the workplace where we don't have sex, where we don't, where sex is legally prohibited in terms of advancements, particularly unwanted advancements, and you're making this who 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 ha <laughs> about, <laughs> about not wanting sex. So we're gonna think there's something wrong with you <laughs> because you seem like a lunatic. I think it is. It really is a backlash against oversexualization. Yeah. And hey, I that's it, probably it, a good look, take. That's a nice, generous take. I think so. I think that you know, and and it really on the in the positive side, I think it it does try to give women a shield against over sexualization, and they can say, "Well, look, I don't really feel like it, and I've got an unassailable reason for not feeling like it." And yeah. you know, you can't. I'm not going to criticize you for you know being um whatever it is that you're into like you know bdsm or something so you don't criticize me for not wanting to have sex yeah that's that's really it um well that's a very generous interpretation it is it is it's my most generous um mm -hmm. but on the other hand like it just leads to this it's just more labeling and it's micro categories and it's narcissistically examining yourself to the to the nth degree where you like you're a variety of rows or something you know you're you're a this cross with a this cross with a this you're a um you're a, a hetero romantic arrow ace gray sexual demi romantic de demi romantic is uh someone who only feels sexual attraction when they have a strong emotional bond with it's someone else person. like a normal person yeah 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 it's, and it, it really a modification though isn't it it's like ordering it starbucks it's like which which do you want a latte or grande or a, you know cappuccino or do you want almond milk or and this is what i think that uh that quote being you know prepared for the market it's it's so apt with this yeah. identity it is yeah i think um, she put the nail right on the head there and i don't always it's not that i don't agree with jennifer on everything it's just that 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 focus on the market it's quite a socialist perspective um and you know i respect it and i can see that she's right she's done a lot of research and she's right about a bunch of stuff but i don't necessarily just focus on that kind of market aspect either i i like to look at all the other um aspects but she's yeah that's the quote I got from that thing we're being colonized for the market I think sometimes people tend to see people tend to read her research and they they only see one side of this phenomenon right so yeah. I'll, I'll often get people say oh you know Jennifer Bielek says that this is all being controlled by six men who own a pharmaceutical company like it's very top down yeah whereas anyone who studies the market knows that you actually need the the base mm. to support that and you know these ideas they go through the market and they have to be sticky mm. they have to hang around a little bit and they have to be transmissible so it's not just enough for one weirdo out there to go, oh, I'm an asexual. Mm. Someone else has to see that and say, oh, yes, I identify with that. I can, you know, that idea is transmitted 
to someone else. It has else. to be a buyer. Yeah, like it has to hang around for a bit as well. So it has to be something that, mm. you know, it's not just there for a week. You know, you, you identify for a little while, right? Which is why we're looking at ways it could be grounded, like um, where why I'm saying maybe it's just people hanging on to it who've got sexual trauma. Yeah. Which apparently is my is my bent. I come across that this week. Um where I come across a tweet where a woman said that I'd blocked her for some bizarre reason. And I'd actually blocked her because she was implying my sexual trauma was making me unable to be mm. sensible about the issue of rape and the way that rape is legislated. So I don't know why um, I talk about it because I know some things about it and I've written about it, um, but I don't want to be known necessarily as a sexual trauma woman. Um, but that's what I see in it. I see that there is there is a way there for um, the burying. I find that the identity, sex identity movement buries the realities of sex and that does it in a way that, actually commodifies um, sex for the market and makes it, hides the weaknesses of the female sex and justifies male, male access to women by replacing consent for some of this strange ideology um, or by making consent look like like what you're saying, you know, I don't really want to have sex, but I will because it's my it used to be the Christian duty, but now it's it's because I'm asexual and this is what I do to Well, it's it's no longer a yeah, it's no longer a duty like because of your um your culture. Like it's it's a duty because like to the other person and it's a duty to their sexuality. And yeah. there's nothing as important as someone's sexuality, is there? Like it's the no. it's the defining characteristic of a person, mm. and you can't go against their sexuality. Can't deny who they are. It, yeah, because that's that's their true self is their it's sexuality. Weird. Isn't that a weird? Religion? It's a weird one. Yeah, it's like a it's like a. Uh, it, Foucault said about the Victorians, they didn't repress sexuality. That's they, all they ever talked about. They talked about sex all the time. Constantly. They made buildings and, which divided people on sex. They they ha, they were obsessed with it. And so this is the same sort of thing. It's not that they don't, they're just obsessed with it. And I do I do think that there's a prudishness in this over sexualization. It's like we'll just we'll talk about it and we'll surface it. And the more we talk about it, that's all we need to do. Um, and, and we'll we have just a week. need to. Let's have a week yeah. for those people that don't want to be talking about having sex all the time. Let's have a week for them. Yeah. And <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it, it's absolutely, um, I, I think it's prudish and I think it dissociates us from mm-hmm. sexuality. Um, from the raw, uncomfortable, messy, details of human relationships and human sex which can be difficult and take frankly professional counseling (laughs) sometimes you need professional counseling sometimes you need good good advice premarital advice pre-relationship advice um advice about boundaries none of this is helpful none of this is giving you know, I know in the church about 30 years ago, there was a book called Boundaries. It was very popular. And all of a sudden, everyone was discovering their boundaries. Um, and, you know, it's a way through the religion, people got a way to talk about real life issues, which is how religions survive. Religions that don't connect to real life issues with people generally don't survive, certainly generation after generation. So this is a kind of a new religion, isn't it? Um, but it seems to be picking up on sexual dysfunction of all kinds and making it into identity, which I guess is one approach. Well, I think the like what like this the object of worship is your sexual identity. 
and it's not even it, you so you're not really worshiping yourself but you're worshiping this this version of yourself that's inside you that you discover as you yeah. go along the optimum and the priesthood and the optimum sexual identity is male sexual identity that appropriates female sexual identity that appropriates a female body mm. um it's every every part of analysis on this uh, i'm almost regret that they taught me cultural analysis they really do destroy you in um post-structural studies at university because you start to deconstruct everything and it's a habit that comes a life time habit and with this stuff i always go to that i'm glad that you give him a positive spin on some of it because i i can't ever see anything but dystopia in it um yeah i like to i like to think about what people get out of it because yeah well you're right if, if it's a product that's given out i mean if we, it is a product for the market in terms of the sexual market um someone has to buy it yeah. And I don't mean financially, someone has to buy into it. And so if people are going and walking the streets and holding signs, there's someone saying, yeah, that's me. Yeah. Get, they get something out of it. And and also, um, you know, one of the biggest, you know, problems if, you're, if you are in business, one of the big, biggest problems is what they call churn, which is people stopping buying your product. Mm. And I'm quite interested in how many people desist from these identities and how we find out that they've desisted. Yeah. So, you know, we often talk about uh, people who are detransitioners or desisters from the gender identity mm. and how we don't really know, like the the proponents of gender identity, they don't want to study who's who's no longer buying their product. No. Um, it's it's very unimportant to them because they're just focused on new acquisitions the whole time. Mm. Um, they don't want to study people who've stopped believing or who've stopped buying into the mythology. No. Um, but we like to study it because it proves that there is a life after gender identity. And I'm really keen to understand who stops being asexual because one of the things I have learned about sexuality is that there are seasons to sexuality mm. um Particularly and for women I think yeah. I think women's sexuality develops over time uh it, it does and you know like there's there's that there are points like if you're if you have kids as well yeah. Like your body changes when you're pregnant, your body changes when you give birth and you, you know, and then you have about a five-year period where either, you know, one or both of you hasn't slept in three days uh -huh. <laughs> and everything is up in the air when uh -huh. it comes to sexuality. Like, you know, everything in the house is covered in vomit or some other disgusting, you know, secretion that's come from the child. And your body is constantly having demands on it, either <laughs> to carry them, to breastfeed them. Yeah. So someone yeah. else, there's another person who's coming into your bed, physically coming into your bed, taking your resources. That's right, yeah. More, and, more the women, the woman's resources than the man's. But, like, as, you know, as a, um, a you know, someone who's had kids, like, there was a season there where sexuality was not the most important thing in our lives. No. Right. And then there are other seasons there where, you know, your schedules don't align, mm. you know, and you've got, and when they do align, the kids have got, need something. Right. And this is where having that multifaceted relationship that has sex and romance and friendship and, dependability and all that sort of stuff it comes into play because yeah. when the sex isn't at the forefront then some of those other aspects are you know you can still you're, you're sit and you can still hold be, hands that's right you're happy to be have a friend <laughs> I remember when you know my first child was born and my body was a bit of a mess and you know things go off boil for a while and I remember thinking gee I'm glad 
we became friends because mm. we didn't even have sex before we were married because we were about to, but we became friends. And we part of the philosophy of that is that you you become a friend, you become friends first without the sex. Mm. Then you start the sexual relationship. And then after the children, not the <laughs> sexual relationship stops. But if there is a, so a problem, there's something that stops it. There's something there. Fine. You've got to have those layers. Right, you realize this is my mate. You know, we're going to get through this because we're friends, um, and we love each other. Um, and so it's m- much more multitask faceted than this. There's sex and there's romance. There's a whole bunch of other stuff there as well. If you're going to make a successful long term relationship and to be compassionate towards each other, I had a good friend who's um. You know, we, we were friends, her and her husband were friends with me and my husband. We were quite close for a period of time. Um, but one thing, eventually he went off with a younger woman. I've told the story before. But at one point he, she had a baby and he was pressuring her quite early on to have sex after the baby was born. And to me that was a real red flag. I thought, yeah, do you have no respect for her body? You know, that's that's not about sex. That's not romance. That's not identity. That's a man who has no respect. And she was a very sexual person. They had a good relationship. They were very happily married. And she sort of said, all right, you know, if you want to. Um, but she said it was really too early. It was horrible. And I thought I really lost all respect for him then. I thought, do you have no, this body has just made you a child. You know, have some bloody respect. It it just really just issues like that where um, the boundaries are really broken in a relationship. This this kind of framework is not helping young people come to terms with the reality of not just sex, but but what what might be a very significant way to build a life together and have children. As if this is not, and I know they put it to the side as if it's heteronormal and all the rest of it, but um you know people do raise children together it's it's part of the human experience and sexuality does come into play i think um which which obviously we're not supposed to be talking about we're just supposed to be talking about how women are going to get liberty through i i think yeah we're not supposed to be talking about um like sexual relationship you know i i i really get the sense that we just talk about sex like sex is a solo is something that you experience as an individual Mm. and another person might be there, but you just, you experience it as an individual. And I think we're, we are not supposed to be talking about the communion of sex. And I think feminists have, let's not let them off the hook. Um, (laughs) (laughs) We're going to get cancelled. A few weeks ago we had a bit of a, uh, fight on the on the Twitter it wasn't it was a while ago um with Holly Lawford Smith was had uh, someone did it I think she did an interview with Colette or something um and she made some comments about uh women and how a lot of women have sex that they don't enjoy and at I one think point that's probably correct yeah, well, statistically, probably factually, yeah. Just not, but but then the yeah. way that it began to be talked about, and she was talking about that women, even after women had climaxed, that point from where they had climaxed to where the man climaxed, he was using her as a masturbatory tool. Hmm. So I, I part sort of company a bit at the way that. Lesbian women, uh, lesbian feminists, sort of theorize heterosexual relationships in a way that they don't put their own in the same sort of light. And I find it sort of reductive and derogatory, actually, um, where they take away sort of agency from women. You know, she might be looking at a watch and saying, All right, hurry up, darling. Um, but that doesn't mean that she becomes a masturbation device you know it really it sort of commodifies women they do commodify women in some way and women's sexual 
in their theoretical frameworks and women's sexual service or sexual labor they would call it it's not all <laughs> it's not all sexual labor you know we don't all think about it like that and in fact we can modify every sexual act in a marriage and sort of add it up or even in a relationship even in a you know purely sexual relationship it just be some of that does become tiresome uh yeah and this this is this is really the crux of why sex is such a problem because it is a relationship and because there are really no winners at the end like at the end of the day it you shouldn't be winning at sex and I think if you're winning at sex you're doing it wrong or <laughs> Yeah, I, think, you know. term, I think a win is is to get it in when the kids are out or when, <laughs> when they're asleep yeah. or manage to find a place for it in life. That's winning at sex. For winning at sex children. is having it. Yeah. <laughs> um. We've uh, but look, it is. It's always going to be a problem because of the way um, the way we have sex as humans. Yeah, like, but the thing was, I, I we, was contacted by some women saying that they they're uncomfortable with that kind of discourse, yeah. um, and as they move back into feminism, like a lot of us are moving back into feminism because the world is falling apart. So as we do move back to feminism, you know, yeah. we 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 should be open to hearing. I hate to say it, what heterosexual women have to say about. Sex. Well, there there are there are heterosexual women. Uh, who are feminist it's not unfeminist to be heterosexual or to be in a relationship with a male I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that if you're a woman and you know you work a full-time job and your male partner does zero housework I think you really have to maybe take a step back from the political movement and uh, think about you know Oh, that's a radical statement. I, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I think that you know, you think some like things are. Wife? Me joking about being a trad wife today. You think if I actually was a trad wife, and I had um. Oh no, no, no! I think if you want to be a trad wife, right? Like, you know, and your husband uh, does actually take care of all of the money. Oh, and you don't work. And but you don't work. You work, and he. If you if you work and he works and he does no housework, yeah, that's problematic. I think so. Isn't that interesting? Because women like that do sometimes come into the movement and they'll uh, complain endlessly about men. Yeah, and how useless they are. Yeah. Um. So that does breed a little bit of uh, unhelpfulness. And to my mind, we need to be harnessing the the talents of men and we need to be uh, maybe encouraging them to resist this uh, gender borg in their own manly way, mm-hmm. right? Not, you know, holding on to our coattails as women, uh, you know, but actually saying no as men we think that this is wrong and here is why and doing their own theory and analysis and yeah yeah because it does actually that's kind of opened up a little idea few thought processes for me so maybe we could make it as a discussion on the dollhouse as well because that's an interesting on the twitter or something it's an interesting concept because i it just has made me think about a woman who I was in a prayer group with for years and years and her husband was he worked but he was he was violent and he was you know mm. really a problem he was a very cruel man all we ever did was talk about him and pray about him that was what we did we just obsessed and it, I'd said many times you really need to leave this man mm. um, but no we were going to pray through it we were going to pray him into the into the um they're doing the right thing but it actually the, the purpose in the end when I look back to it after you said that is that it actually did dominate all the time together that man was all we ever talked about mm. so in a, in a in a sense that dynamic that useless husband not useless man who goes and works but doesn't do anything else and is a 
violent controlling bastard um he kind of allow it's it's a dilemma though i'm conflicted because she thought when i did say leave him she said he'll kill me which is statistically possible so and we did give her support for all those years and we were a christian prayer group not a mm. And it, it just goes to show how, you know, one one person's dysfunction or, you know, difficult situation, it can um, have a really profound impact on the social group. And okay. this is where I think we really need to be quite careful in terms of like the feminist movement mm. in that, you know, we're not a prayer group, we're not mm. a social group, we're not mother's club um you know we're trying to build a political movement Mm. yeah we're not you know we're not support we're trying to build a political movement yeah you're right yeah Yeah. there's a certain there's a certain sort of um i i don't know how i don't really want to say we have to be callous but there's you, you need to be at a certain kind of level in order to participate yeah and if you you're not able to like if you need support then I think you need to seek support first yeah before you try to give because building a political movement it takes everything out of you yeah and support of your partner is important I think um I I know that you've got the support of your partner and my husband's always supported me in everything I've done and he um, thought I was going to become a brilliant political leader one day, <laughs> <laughs> and he would become the house well, husband. If you so were... had no interest in politics, that was the only just, problem. <laughs> you just have to stop blocking people on Twitter. I have to stop. It's blocking. probably step one is stop blocking yeah. people. Well, I've I've just looked at my and I don't follow. I don't watch my followers that much, but there's been a lot of unfollowing and me, but also new followers. So there's there's a shift happening at the moment politically um the political situation in the middle east that everyone's decided to you know mm. play the the middle east hunger games uh hasn't helped um but i think you're right i think we need to do need to talk about those kind of things and say look um this is this is politics you know um we talk about sexual politics because that's what feminism does and you know i brought up the issue of um Holly's kind of analysis about um, sexual labour. I understand why they commodify women's sexual labour and women's reproductive labour. I understand why that's useful in an analytical framework, but it does alienate some uh, some women when you go into that sort of discourse, particularly the kind of Sheila Jeffries kind of talk about penetrating everything. Um, well, we, we do need to talk about sexual labour and we do need to talk yeah. about it because, uh, you know, there because of the differences in sexual, um, you know, activity and desire between men and women, um, there'll all, always be conflict. There's, there's yeah. bound to be conflict between men and women uh, over sexuality and sexual activity. And so... We do need to talk about it and we do need to talk about how men's sexual entitlement is not the answer. And but that doesn't way. mean... It's a dominant cultural yeah. framework, doesn't it? Yeah. It like, you know, I think asexuality, it, it does seem like it is a byproduct of men's sexual entitlement. And what's more, it facilitates men's sexual entitlement yeah. It all it does is give some few women an excuse not to be sexually active, or not even to not be sexually active, but to pick and choose uh, their their sexual activity, mm. um, or to be a little bit more picky about their partners, right? But these some of these women they talk about overcoming their repulsion to sexual activity overcoming their repulsion because they really like a man and they really want to have a relationship and they have to work through their issues with sexuality. Now, 
it just frustrates me. There's very little I can say about it. Mm. Like, you know, I've I've got two children and they're of the age now where we have, you know, have to sort of start talking to them about some of these things. And there's no way that we would say to them, oh, well, some people just need to overcome their repulsion in order to have a relationship, you know, no. But like this is, it's fully men's sexual entitlement that the idea that to have a relationship, you need to actually overcome some repulsion to have sex with someone. And even then, that if you don't want to have sex with them, then you need to outsource the sex because nothing is as important as a man being able to sexually penetrate a woman. And with the access to pornography as well, if I had have seen some of those images at that age, I probably would have said, yeah, I won't be doing that, you know, because a lot of it's very violent. Maybe they've got the wrong idea. Here's an idea. Maybe you got the wrong idea about sex. Maybe it's not a good idea for gay men to be teaching 13-year-old girls about sex. Maybe we shouldn't let Akon dominate all the workplaces and have weeks where they talk about a nonsense identity that is just a shield for grooming and sexual trauma. Well, I don't know. Yeah, minus 18 and wear it purple which are charities like their their youth charities, which are run by, you know, young people who don't really understand the seasons of life. They, you know, they're young people. They haven't gone through mm. the experiences that that we have. They they don't necessarily understand that um some people have high sex drive some people have low sex drive and it changes over your life and your relationships women have different kind of life cycles about sex than men do and very little of those cycles has anything to do with glitter or drag or parading down the streets or any of the other stuff that we associate with mardi gras right it's usually about pleasure and about you know connection and discovering your body discovering your independence so what else do we have anything else to talk about with asexuality have we wrong this topic wrong um look i did say that there was some positive aspects to it um mm-hmm. yes i was very happy to hear that you had a positive view <laughs> and uh look probably the one thing i would say is that uh, a couple of years ago in 2021 girl guides uh, uk put out a post on Twitter um, like regarding asexuality and they were widely criticised and there was uh, there were a couple of really good threads basically saying that this was, it's a really dangerous identity to be engaging in, especially for an organisation like Girl Guides mm. and it provides cover for abusers you know, for example, you might have a leader who says he's asexual. It might lead the parents to be more trusting, leaving their children alone with him. Mm. Um, he might, you know, be able to like pass off like some touching as, oh, but it's asexual touching. Mm. It's not sexual. And he could even say, um, oh, look, no one will believe you because I'm asexual, Mm. right? So, you know, like just thinking some of this stuff through a little bit before you jump on the corporate bandwagon to to promote whatever the latest week is, you know. And we know from the Australian Workplace Equality Index that essentially what workplaces do is they, they just get told, oh, you need to promote some week you know, you need to promote something, some awareness week, and they will just, corporations will just pick one. And they might, they'll just, you know, one year they'll do bisexuality, one year they'll do asexuality, and they just pick a week that works in with the rest of their corporate content calendar. Yeah. So they don't put a lot of thought in behind it. No. And this is one of the ones that you really do have to think through because they're, it has serious ramifications. Yeah, I mean, take the piss out of it all you like. I've been doing that as well. Um, 
we've started the, the thing with a story about not giving a fuck and that's one of my favorite little comments about it um it's great to make fun of it and if it comes across your desk you know laugh it up but we also need to be well uh, i am uh, celebrating my dry spell at the moment oh yes that's right. i am Yep, I've got my ace pin, I've got my ace balloons, I've got my ace t-shirt, I've got my ace uh, I am not broken sign. Um, well, yeah. You know, never sent any me that material. I could wear it around the house. <laughs> there's a there's a t-shirt in the mail. There's, oh, nice. A... Ace, the ace of spades. Nah. <laughs> well, of course, people in history, like being... One of the claims that they they'll make when they come up with a new sexuality is, oh, but it's it's as old as people are, you know. Everyone's always and, been sexual. Um, and it's it's but kind of funny because, asexual. yeah, they say, oh, you know, um, oh, so and so is asexual, or, um, yeah. But the thing is, humans have been having sex for a long time. We have words to describe all the different things that humans do with regards to sex. There are ancient sculptures, there are carvings, there are cave paintings, there's scratchings in the mud, there's cuneiform tablets, there's all sorts of stuff that describes all the things that people do. Mm. If there wasn't a word for this, before 2003 then it's not as old as time no you've made it up and yeah it's nonsense that'll be my final word anyway so that's asexuality mm. and all of our feelings about it that is yes anything else happening this week before we sign i, I know moira deeming's been on a tour with um with rachel right. wong of the of the uk of the turf island I'm just scrolling her Twitter feed now. She's got Graham Lennon there and I can see her with Helen Joyce and Maya Forstater. It's like some sort of love fest over there, which is nice. Is it an asexual love fest? Or I is think it a... so. I, I don't see any. Oh, there's that horrible picture. That, uh, there was a debate with um, Helen Joyce and uh, Fred. What's his name? Frida Wallace. That's it. And uh, the pedophile guy. Peter um, Tatchell. Peter Tatchell. Um, and it looks like Frida's got all his bollocks hanging out. Apparently it's the top of his thigh. Um, yeah, I did have a close I, had, I did have a close zoom in and it's not actually a testicle. His bollocks, but it, yeah. It, it but does I was happy to look. suggest it was like the bollocks and there was a cartoon of it being his bollocks and I thought that was quite funny. It looks it looks really testicular, but it's not. Um so just as a visual for the listeners, um, uh, there's a bloke who thinks he's a woman and he's come to a serious debate against Helen Joyce wearing uh, knee-high leather boots and black fishnet stockings and a mini skirt and he's actually st- sitting up on a raised dais on the stage so he can see everything. Um it's very unpleasant. It's, it's a very unattractive look. It's not nice, yeah. No. So why he felt the need to come dress as a prostitute, we don't know. Helen Joyce, to be fair, has got high boots and has oh. stuff. Uh, but she has um, a sort of midi, mid-length skirt um, and the stockings are full cover. So she didn't wear fishnets and she's dressed, you know, like a middle-aged woman which is what we do yeah so I have I have actually made these sorts of wardrobe errors in the past where you wear something and it ends up being a little bit too short Mm. or you know like you think maybe you're going to be behind a desk Mm. or you're going to be standing and you're not yeah and really you don't have a lot of options but um probably what I what I usually suggest is put the jacket on the knees Mm. which is a good one and it gives you a bit of coverage or knees together and sit on the side yeah so that the audience isn't staring directly up the crotch especially when you've got your legs crossed and to the side where you 
yeah, you can sort of just go yeah, off to the side a bit, you know, and just turn. Well, it be too defensive to sit. I remember I had a wedding, not a wedding dress, pregnancy dress once, and it was just a little bit. I'd put, I'd gone a bit further than I thought. It was actually a little mid dress, but it turned into a bit of a mini skirt, and I didn't realize that when I got out. And I remember being extremely uncomfortable. I was only young. I think I was 27 when I first got pregnant. Um, pulling it down all night, you know. It was yeah. kind of the only nice black kind of dress I had um, that would fit me. And I remember being incredibly uncomfortable all night. He's not uncomfortable. He's he doesn't, he doesn't look it, no. Um, or the other option is, uh, you know, this has just turned into wardrobe advice now. The, uh, the other option is run down to the chemist and get some opaque tights. Yes. You know, if if you've really made a mistake. Like Helen's got um, yeah. Yeah, run down, get some opaque tights and, you know, at least you've got something covering the region. Yeah, that's right. Um, but... You know, as someone who's, you know, only been a woman for, um, I don't know, how long has Fred been a woman? I don't know. Uh, you know, technically we'd probably say zero minutes. Zero days. Yeah. But <laughs> someone who's only been uh, simulating a woman. Yeah, for... wearing, wearing female fashion, wearing women's fashion. And has it's not he... women's fashion, really. There's nothing it's, about that that's women's fashion. That's well, it's quite that's possible costume. he's not really under, like he's never come across um, uh, that a situation where he wants to dress modestly and be taken seriously. Yeah, no, he's demanding respect rather than requesting it, which is something yeah. that women are not Whereas, doing. That. Like for us, the thing is, there was a few comments on there about how, oh, women don't dress like that. Women don't dress like that for a serious event. The reason we don't dress like that for a serious event mm. is because there is a, a huge tension for women between getting attention, mm. right, by dressing nicely, by being attractive, by being sexually attractive, um, but being, but then also being taken seriously mm. by not being too sexually attractive and not yeah. drawing focus away from the intellectual rigor that we're bringing to the table. So and that's about costume as well. Even business suits are a costume. Yeah, uh, that's Fred why we have those costumes. costumes. But that costume is one of fetishes of prostitution. Of yeah, it's not. It's it's a well known costume. Um, um it was in pretty woman and even it's, if it's the pretty woman outfit but julia roberts is a tall well certainly in that film very sexy woman extremely attractive woman there's none of that going on with fred there's nothing there that's attractive and if a woman of that size and that age wore that outfit she'd be subject to ridicule that i think that's one, one of the things that the women were pointing out as well um because it's not appropriate women don't um you know it's not appropriate certainly in middle class respectable society no and i think the really the really sort of strange thing is that it looks like there's a bit at the top of his thigh which we can see right mm -hmm. where the fishnet doesn't reach so either they they're like a suspender type fishnet or he's got a massive hole in the crotch yeah neither of those things is is attractive um, no. but you know cartoon did you see the cartoon yeah it was a, it yeah. was pretty i shared that i'm, I'm pretty not sorry. pretty brutal yeah it's pretty brutal yeah but anyways myra's been on the on the uh tour and she looks like she's having a good time i got inside information today that she may be meeting um dennis noel kavanagh and Menno for lunch. Oh. I've given her discreet advice to not drink with Dennis Snow Kavanagh um, because that can end up, even for a nice Christian woman like me, three o'clock in the morning, walk on the streets of Brisbane back to hotels and trying to get him safe home and having a two-day hangover. 
which has wow. happened for me. It was entirely unpleasant. All right. So well, the um... evening was fun, but the, uh, for someone who doesn't drink, yeah, it took me a few days to get over the, the Kavanaugh experience. So lock up your daughters. Uh, Dennis Kavanaugh is. <laughs> lock sure up your Christian housewives. Be corruptible like me. I'm sure she'll be a much better Christian than me. Certainly won't be drinking, this, you know, in bars, whatever bars open. Hmm, at three o'clock um, in the morning. Well, good luck to uh, Rachel and, and Moira over there. And mm. it does look like you're having a really wonderful time um, meeting all the, the heroes and hopefully just getting a lot of inside goss about how the UK progressed and what we need to do in Australia in order to um, to move us forward. I know that we, we all look to the UK for inspiration and... Um, yeah, we um, we hope that the, this is actually proving to be a fruitful tour. I know getting a lot of information and uh, not losing it in a hangover memory hole. Uh, one last issue I wanted to mention briefly. Well, I won't talk about the details because it's a it's a legal case, but um, it's come just breaking news today is that the person that they've been suppressing the name of in Queensland who has uh, up on charges, alleged charges of alleged sexual assault, is Bruce Lerman, who oh. uh, was the guy in the Brittany Higgins case. Um, everyone's trying to be sensitive, and I don't want to talk about the details, but um, there are two charges. It's quite different from the Higgins case. Um I was just reading a thread now. Gillian Dempsey, um, she's a barrister, but she she's made a thread saying that the charge is stealthing, which is deliberately removing a condom uh, during otherwise consensual sex. So that will be an interesting, I'll be following that because I find that an interesting um, case, um, not sort of suggesting guilt or innocence either party. People might be, might be surprised that I don't automatically jump to believe all women. I am interested in the way that sexual assault is prosecuted through the courts. Um, and I think that, that I wrote about this issue with uh, Higgins and I thought it was handled appallingly by the elites of Canberra. So I'm keen to see no political interference, actually, um, and to see the way that the court process works because there's a new rule in Queensland, a new law, that was pushed through through some feminist organisations here, that they should be able to release the names of sexual offenders, alleged sexual offenders, when they're charged. Mm. But this is the new thing, and I'll be watching it. And that very is... unpopular commenting on it. I know that, um, speaking of Dennis Kavanagh, he said to me the other day, can't you have an opinion about, can't you have one popular opinion about something? I don't <laughs> think you can. Uh, I think that is what um, Assange was uh, accused of, wasn't he? Oh, really? I, I thought that was what uh, he was meant to have done, the stealth thing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, it, it's the thing. Men and women are different and uh, men's sexual entitlement is something that we need to talk about. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think, you know, just just back on the asexuality, just saying that you're asexual doesn't uh, explore, analyse or resolve any of these issues. No. No. The reality of sex is everywhere and we're not helping girls by shielding them in nonsense. No. And Akon are prolific um, distributors of nonsense. Yes, we have a we have an Akon video. Um, it's very long, um, but it's an Akon video that was produced for a workplace where a woman talks about in depth about what it means to her to be asexual, 
And it's it's very much like the standard nonsense you get about asexuality. We'll link that in the show notes and you can um you can peruse that at your leisure. Oh, um, but it is it is produced by Acon. So um it gives you an idea of the kind of the caliber of material that they're actually bringing into workplaces and the level of gaslighting that they're doing mm. uh, of women in workplaces. Uh, and it's, um, you know, about five minutes in, uh, the woman who's, you know, claims to be asexual then goes on to talk about how, well, she still has sex, right, mm. even though she still has sex because her partner enjoys it and that's, you know, what she needs to do for her partner. So while you know, she's allowed to have this identity, it actually isn't helping her. No. It just it's seems... just helping her gaslight herself. Yeah, so lie back and think of England nonsense, isn't it? It is, yeah. So if that's asexuality, I think we have. I think we've covered it. I'd be happy never to cover it again. Thank you for joining us in the dollhouse. Uh, please like, share, comment and subscribe. We are on YouTube, Substack, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And we really like reading your comments. So please, um, if you have something to say about the episode, uh, pipe up and let us know what it was. I'm Kit Kowalski, and I'm here with Edie Wyatt. And we'll be back next week with all the news and views in the Aussie genderverse. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. You talk all that sweet talk, but I ain't coming back. Cut you off, I don't need your love. So you can try all you want. Your time is up, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. You say you're